Hi everyone, and welcome to our Canary Row Day Hoop De Doodle Celebration Program. Uh, before I introduce our special guests, I'd like to thank our community partners, the Canary Row Foundation, the Canary, Canary Row Company, the Western Flyer Foundation, and the Monterey Public Library. And before we begin, just a few housekeeping uh, rules. Um, if everyone could please mute themselves uh, during the presentation, just to kind of help limit any distractions uh, throughout the presentation. And if any questions arise during the presentation, um, please feel free to put them in the chat as they come up. Or if you'd like to hold off till the end, um, we'll have some time for some question and answering. So today our special guest is Greg Kaye, and he'll be talking about the natural fluctuations, sea stars, urchins, kelp, and squid. Greg Kaye is a professor emerit of biology at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, whose specialty is ichthyology and marine ecology. He is a former president of the Cannery Row Foundation. Thank you, Greg, for joining us today, and it's all yours. So I was asked because of my background to talk about fluctuations in ecosystems around the area. Mm. And I chose one that's very controversial and very well studied now on kelp and the role of predators like sea stars and grazers like urchins and other organisms in the system, maybe even sea otters, might have. I also, since I'm an ichthyologist by trade, I thought I'd cover a little bit about the sardine anchovy fluctuations and squid. So we'll give you an idea about what's going on. Um, by way of introduction, we all know that Ed Ricketts almost daily did his intertidal collecting. I would call them surveys too, because he wrote notes on everything. And he wrote the book Between Pacific Tides from those observations. And most of that was done out of his 800 Canary Row um, living quarters, the lab, EBL, Pacific Biological Laboratories. Michael Hamp wrote a great book. There's a new edition out on Canary Row, the history of John Steinbeck's Old Ocean View Avenue. Here's John on the, on the right side. There's the lab in the middle. And there's Ed holding a large squid, a giant squid, and a figure of him that the Canary Row Foundation built and posted at the site where he died in the late 40s from the train wreck, or the train hitting him. He collected his, I gotta go back, excuse me. He collected most of his animals. I'm sorry, the double screen thing's killing me. He collected most of his animals in the intertidal, that is places you can walk to and use waders. Um, a lot of work has been done since then on the subtitle, and I thought I would do that, but I was also told to try to make some connection with the Steinbeck book of, of the year, Sweet Thursday, that we're covering. And there were lots of discussions among our committee um, that said that we ought to do something on long-term ecological observations like those of Ed Ricketts, who was Doc in Steinbeck's novels, and so on. Um, in this case, I've chosen kelp, sea stars, otherwise known as starfish, but I'm using sea stars, sea urchins, and fish and squid populations in the Monterey area to show you that even though Ricketts knew a lot about what he saw one year, maybe a few years in a row, it's very different now that we have lots of surveys and observers looking at the marine environment. Rocky intertidal organisms are very diverse and they're zoned by tidal height. That's why they're called intertidal. And that was his specialty. There's him looking down at a tide pool and there are some of the organisms. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about subtidal organisms, which are also very diverse, maybe even more so. But scuba diving was not yet available to Ricketts and he only saw these organisms when brought in by fishermen, fisher people now, and so on. So there's a whole trophic system involved with the things in the word kelp and crustaceans, sea stars, urchins, mollusks, uh, including abalone and of course the sea otter and fishes. So starting from the kelp in the lower left circle, we go through this, these arrows point to which organisms depend on which others. The urchins graze on kelp, at least on the detritus and kelp and Sea stars graze on urchins, among other things, and they compete with abalone. And then, of course, at the top of the food chain, 
uh, is the, the, the sea otter, which it turns out in this party, this, this uh, story doesn't really pay that much, uh, have that much influence. And then of course, my favorite, the fishes, and that's not the right one to show, but it was in the diagram. On the right side, you can see uh, photographs of these organisms um, in nature. The whole point here is that all populations fluctuate. What we need to do, know and what most ecologists and endocrinologists and fishery biologists are doing is looking what the reasons for these, these are. Some of these are natural, some of them are environmental, um, some by trophic interactions, predator prey, some by humans, anthropologic or anthropogenic. And those are mainly through exploitation and overfishing, but nowadays also by rapid driven climate change, which you can't avoid anymore. This talk will compare with an honest observer like Ed Ricketts. As I said, he was Doc in Camry Row and Sweet Thursday, would observe of populations in a specific area from his limited years of observation and what happens now with lots and lots of ecologists and fishery scientists learning from monitoring surveys in many geographic locations and over many years. In some cases, the likely cause and effect can be pretty easy to predict, but it, in others, it takes observations, experiments, and other kinds of detailed uh, look-sees to see what the causes of mortality, recruitment, and settlement are in changing the populations of organisms. I had to make this relevant to the series of Sweet Thursday, so I got a printed text of Sweet Thursday, the novel. I did read it also, and I, I, I scanned for kelp. And I got one on page 69 when the seer in the sand dunes that Dave talked about, David talked about last week, says the doc that he imagines a mermaid in the kelp forest. So that really doesn't relate to my talk, but it is a marine mammal of sorts. The seer also discusses eating sea urchins, and that would be their gonads. That really doesn't relate to it either, although it's the organism. And on pages 14 and 101, Ricketts did go out and in as Doc, he went out to collect sea stars to do embryonic series. And he explains to his girlfriend-to-be that he is studying the embryo embryonic development of sea stars so students can see how they get to be. That was his focus, looking at the organisms, where they live, how, what habitats they occupied, and how they got along in life. But he doesn't really discuss much the effects of a kelp in a kelp forest of sunlight, temperature, sea stars as predators, urchins as grazer, et cetera, might exert. So that's what I decided to try to focus on. We have two major players in the algae category. There's the giant kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera, which is a perennial alga, according to Rosenthal, Clark, and Dayton in their 74 paper, where they tagged a bunch of them off Del Mar. They live maximum about seven years, maybe more, and on the average, three or four years. That's a different location. It could be different other places. And they mostly are abundant south of San Francisco, and they grow on rocky substrate, as does the other kelp, Neriocystis, and depths from six meters to greater than 30 meters. That's 20 to 98 feet. The bull kelp, usually farther north, is an annual alga. It lives one year and then dies. It ranges from the Aleutian Islands all the way down to Point Conception. And it's a dominant kelp above Davenport, California. And it has similar characteristics in terms of attaching to rocky substrate. Its depths are a little shallower. OK, since I'm an ichthyologist, I had to go to one of my former colleagues. I guess he's still my colleague, Mike Graham and his, his friends. And there's a diagram here. Can you guys see the arrow when I'm doing that on the screen? OK, the dark um, ovals are sort of the juveniles and adults. And the open ones are the gametes that turn into the metophytes, that turn, turn into sporophytes. And that's the cycle of the alga, the algae that we're talking about. We're mostly interested in the recruits, what comes right after the sporophytes, and then to the adults. The diagrams on the right show the effects of day length, light, nutrients, storms, et cetera, on both annual variations, intra-annual, where I didn't do that on purpose. Um, 
in the winter time, they're less population, the, the cover is less. In the summertime, when the photosynthesis occurs, they grow and there's less water action. So that's intra-annual variation. Below is a series of years from Mike Donilon's master's thesis at um, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories showing intra, intra, that's not right, inter-annual um, spatial and temporal variability of kelp. So the kelp themselves fluctuates. And the reasons for this, I'm gonna to try to cover today. But before I do that, I'm gonna to need to say something. Number one, I was on the Sanctuary Advisory Council for over 10 years when it first started. That was a real experience. I don't get into socioeconomic and political things very often. And then it was good because we had a few ecologists that helped me out. Steve Webster was the main one. There's another quote in the report that came out of this thing where kelp harvesting was an issue at the time. And now, as you see, it's also an issue for other reasons. Um, whether we found a quote from Charles Darwin in 1845, he knew a lot. There is one marine production which from its importance is worthy of a particular history, it is the kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera. This plant grows on every rock, well, not really every rock, but most rocks, from low water mark to great depth, not really great depth, so about 80 meters, both on the outer coast and within the channels. The number of living creatures of all orders whose existence intimately depends on the kelp is wonderful. A great volume might be written describing the inhabitants of the kelp beds of seaweed. I can only compare these great aquatic forces to those of intertropical region. And indeed, there are great volumes written about kelp from all the people succeeding Ed Ricketts and his initial observations. Uh -huh. So from that report, you can see, first of all, on the right, you can see the annual fluctuations of kelp in the canopy surface area. And then what they came up with were management areas um, by the sanctuary, the open bed 221 to the right off seaside, Canary Row uh, off the aquarium, the open bed um, where there's no kelp harvesting because that's um, an area that was um, Monterey kelp, no harvest experimental area. The open bed, parts close to Point Lobos at the north and open bed number 218, parts open uh, to the south of Point Lobos. So you can see that report already characterized kelp and a lot of their variation. The players of this story are the three, I don't know what's happening, I'm not touching anything. I guess I'm speaking too loud. Um, the giant kelp macrocystis periphera and the giant kelp forest on the lower left, the bull kelp to the north of here is to the right. And the sea star um, that is one of the predators is on the upper left and two species of sea urchins are on the right. These are predator, predator prey interactions of a really interesting nature. Uh -huh. um, Leslie Willoughby of the National Geographic wrote a paper called As Sea Stars Die, New Worries About Urchins Occur. Some urchins waste away, others come out of, uh, of their uh, crevices and um, their sea star disease ripples the California coast. The basic story is these sea stars get this virus. This virus is uh, killing sea stars. The sea stars are normally predators of sea urchins. And since that many have died since the early 2000s, 2010s, um, it's caused major impact on the food web from them. Part of the reason for this is the virus. Part of the reason might be what they call marine heat, heat waves, MHWs, which I just found out about while preparing this talk. That was an, including the thing called the blob uh, about 10 years ago, not quite. It, uh, increasing acidification and other fac uh, factors that has made the virus um, strong and the sea star is vulnerable to it. And this is being studied by Pete Ramundi, um, a faculty member at UC Santa Cruz and his colleagues and students. So trying to figure out what's causing sea stars to waste away and allow sea urchins to form what are called barrens. We haven't used that word before. Sea urchin barrens, I'll show you a picture of it, is where sea urchins dominate the seafloor and control what goes on in the sea floors. There are the urchin barrens that I told you I'd show you. Um, and, the, and these areas are dominated by two species of kelp, which I've already talked about, and the role that ocean temperatures 
the blob or marine heat waves has had on kelp, sea star wasting disease, the predatory role of sea stars, the grazing pressure of larger sea urchin populations, causing, in some cases, urchin barrens. Very early on, when I was an undergraduate, actually, and when I was a graduate student, Mike Foster and I at UC Santa Barbara um, were involved with looking at this, there was a huge sea urchin barren that occurred off Palos Verdes, giant kelp canopy area. And it turns out, that here's what happened. The canopy went up, down, and in the late 50s, early 60s. And, the, and what was it um, causing it was sediment emissions. As it turned out, they started killing urchins, going crazy, trying to solve the problem. And it wasn't that. It was sewage treatment of Point Lobos, Point Loma. And um, when they increased the sewage treatment, the urchins came back. So Foster and, and Shields' uh, paper on this, killing sea urchins didn't really solve the problem. It may still solve the problem up here, but there is still interannual variability, and that was helped by sewage treatment. So that's the first story I know of the area. There's some local studies by Jim Watanabe and Chris Harrell from the early 90s talking about patches in Carmel Bay where sea urchin grazing could destroy portions of kelp forests. That was published in the Marine Ecology Pro Progress Series. Now, here's the point of my whole story. There are many institutions doing surveys of kelp ecosystems and other ecosystems all along the West Coast and elsewhere in the world. This is a paper very recently um, in 2000 by a group of people from all around the Monterey Bay area. I won't even go through the names. But the picture on the right shows the eco regions that are there. And the three I'm focusing on in Northern California, Central California, and the Southern California Bight. And these little boxes are the programs that now exist that are shown in this would be the Alaska program in red. The green is PISCO, Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of the Coastal Ocean, if I've got that right. I think it was really named after some kind of South American looker, but I don't know. Somebody else would have to tell you that. And Reef Check, which is diver surveys in green. There's a Mexi Mexican, um, there's two Mexican surveys going on as well. So they're studying all along the coast of, of the Western part of the United States. It's pretty amazing what, what effort there has been. The whole focus is this really neat diagram. It did it again. Okay, I'm going forward. Um, which shows what was published by Smith et al. Um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, showing that in the lower graph left, Pycnopodia, the sea star, went up and then started going down. At the time it was going down, the sea urchins went up because they're no longer being preyed upon by the sea star. And at the same time, kelp, whether it's adult kelps or um, recruits, are grazed down by the urchins and the sea otter virtually has very little to do with this. And I think the reason for that is um, to come in the ne uh, next slide. And it shows this cascading effect, um, which is mostly what I'm talking about today. But there are some differences in the two stories. This is the one where you can get an idea of all the survey sites along the coast of the Monterey Peninsula. And there's a lot of dots there and the black triangle show sea otter urchin focal patches where they're really concentrated on their surveys. The kelp density is shown here. You can see high density, um, high surveys, and you can see lower density, lower surveys, and so on, down from Lover's Point down to the other side of Cabrillo Point. The urchin densities are, are similar to those, and you can see the urchins have really gone high right here in the spot where the kelp is now low. And the gonad index, that's separate. That's about the otters. The otters, it turns out, that are living in urchin barrens, are tr have tried to eat urchins that are in barrens, but they're not getting the food they normally get. So their gonads aren't as well developed. And from what I understand, the otters ignore them. The otters are eating urchins in kelp forests and doing pretty well. I haven't seen a paper on that, but I've heard a lot of talk at the research activity panel of that phenomenon. The sea otter densities, Although they've increased in green, that's Santa Cruz, in the reddish color, 
that's Monterey and it's still increasing in leveling. And Big Sur is also increasing. They're coming back, going south. But because of that sea urchin gonad situation, they don't seem to be regulating the urchins yet. It could happen, nobody knows for sure. But that was the latest I got on that subject. So here's the scenario that I came up with. Pycnopodia, the sea star demise, due to sea star wasting, which is a virus, was perhaps related to ocean warming, marine heat waves in the blob, and ocean acidification. The cause and effect of those, I'm not as well aware of as others are, but some people could probably uh, help me with that. The urchins emerged following the demise of the sea, the sea stars. Most urchins came from refuge in crevices, and they were detectable by divers because they were in crevices hiding from sea otters. They were uniformly increasing over a magnitude, and that's, that's from this PNAS publication, 600% in those two years in the early 2010s, becoming sea urchin barons. And there was some subsequent recruitment of smaller barons. The sea otter densities, which increased but didn't really seem to cause a problem through differential predation, and there has been a subsequent decline in density and cover of giant kelp, probably also related to marine heat waves the blob and ocean warming. There have been efforts, and I'm going to go back because it did it to me again. The efforts are underway by divers from Reef Check and other organizations to reduce sea urchin density. And there have been discussion, I think a PhD thesis at UC Santa Cruz, looking into kelp bed restoration. So man is doing his best. It did that without me touching it, you guys. Okay. Now, that's central California off our coast. Northern California, it's a similar story, and there are some papers that I'll get to shortly, but this one by Russ, Ross Clark, who graduated from Moss Landing and now runs a, a, a coastal ecosystem program at the lab, pointed out that a, a recruitment, massive recruitment of sea urchins in the Northern Carol, Calif California area and Oregon and Washington, when sea star populations have gone down due to illness, same story, and they've gone from big forests and urchin barrens. Now the alga is different. Rather than hiding in rocky crevices, there's a 60-fold increase in urchin numbers, and everybody's really worried about it. One of the main reasons that this is different is that there were viable populations of abalone up there, and that's one of the major concerns in Northern California. Continuing on, Mark Carr at UC Santa Cruz suggested that the return of the kelp won't likely happen until storms or disease reduce urchin numbers, and then, of course, the predator, Pycnopodia, the sea star, should increase and sufficiently to reduce the purple urchin numbers appreciably. All this is hand waving at this stage, but the point is trophic cascades are influential and they're being influenced by environmental events. Mark Carr also suggested that there are areas where kelp has been saved and they, he called them oases, might be effective if the divers can find islands of those surrounded by sand and remove the urchins from those islands. So you don't want the urchins to kill off the viable kelp populations. And there's, if there are storm related reductions in urchin numbers and in kelp, it would uh, make clear ground below to allow kelp to recruit. Mike Graham uh, from Moss Landing reflected in that article that a mild La Nina condition could fuel high pro productivity of kelp and whatever remains from those oases could replenish. Now, that was um, 2018, so it's three years. I don't know what's happened since then. But if this happened on the North Coast, it would be short-lived because don't forget, bull kelp, Nereocystis, is an annual. And so it comes and goes every year. So we're watching the urchin kelp interactions. This is a nice diagram. It's a little complex, but I'm going to explain it to you, I hope. I can't see the right side very well, but this bar here is a shaded bar they say is yellow, but it's not yellow. 1997-98 El Nino, warm water. You see the kelp goes down, okay? A little later, this it happens again. A little later, there is what they call a red bar, which is really sort of light red, which was a blob phenomenon in 2015. It was combined with an El Nino in 2015 and 16, and then a shaded yellow bar, which is this one right here, during um, the last period. This dotted line 
is where the sea stars died off. So that graphically shows the whole sequence in a really recent article, 2021. You can't get more recent than that, can you? I don't think. Anyway, that's the story from them. And it shows in here graphs that um, illustrate this. The top graph is a combined thing of every, all the op observations below. So ignore that unless you want to go back and forth. But here are the fluctuations in bull kelp. In the upper left, you can see it goes up and down, up and down, up and way down. This is the down part that they're really worried about. The sunflower, sea star, right here, Pycnopodia, goes down. I can't see the right end of the curve, but I think it's labeled, it's leveled down. Then the marine heat wave days go up and down. Here was a big one in one of the El Nino things. And then there's another increase and a huge decline uh, later. And then the purple urchin, and I can't see the right side, but I know what it does, it goes up. Okay, so there's a good graphic describing the sequence of events in the Northern California region. I hope everybody's been able to follow that. Now I'm gonna be going into fish and squid examples of fluctuations as well. We can talk about it and have questions and answers about the kelp urchins, sea stars, and sea, or sea otter fluctuations later. Tim Thomas has already talked about um, the sardinops, the Monterey sardines, but he didn't really put too much emphasis on natural fluctuations. And I really want to talk about this, maybe because they're fishes and squid, which I've studied. They also fluctuate. Here's Sardinops sagax perulia, the Pacific sardine, going up and then dying off here. Right around here is when Ed Ricketts and the Monterey Herald said, I know where they've gone, they've all gone to cans. And that really wasn't exactly true because a lot of them went to fish meal too. And Tim can back me up on that or, or disagree if he wishes. But as you can see, the Pacific sardines since then have started coming up slowly but surely. The axis is different. These are millions of pounds. These are millions of pounds, but the axes are very different and the sardines are recovering. Now there's a really neat record and I can't spend a lot of time on this, but it's by Andy Sutard and John Isaacs years ago, followed up by Baumgard and its, its scripts and Sucesse in Ensenada, looking at sediment cores in the Santa Barbara basin and looking at scales. And some people are starting to look at otoliths, ear bones, over 2000 years. And what you can see is there's major fluctuations up and down. I put a green line here because there's a major decline in the sardine coupled with an increase in, in anchovies, even more so later. So in these dips in sardines, you get increases in, in anchovies. It suggested competition, but it's mainly not because of that, you don't think. It's mainly due to the response to the environment. There was a um, summary paper by Francisco Chavez and colleagues at Mabari. Um, titled from anchovies to sardines and back, talking about multi-decadal changes in the Pacific Ocean. It was in science in 2003. I understand there's been some controversy about this, but it paints my picture because all I care right now about is fluctuations. And I think I saw Richard Parrish's name in the audience, and so I'll get some answers from him. But this paper shows these indices are going to be hard for you to read because they're hard for me to read. But in this paper, this is air temperature, Pacific decadal oscillation, atmospheric circulation index, Mauna Loa CO2 levels, which start later, and regime indicators. The whole point is there are climate regimes that do influence the ocean that are warmer and colder. And what happens with them in their warmer years is you get sardines blossoming like they are now, and in the colder years, you get anchovies blossoming. This, this curve goes from 1910 to 2009, I believe. So seabirds are also included. They fluctuate according to their prey. So they all fluctuate in different temperature regime, regimes over a century of time. So fluctuations really are natural. But parts of them, like the decline in the sardines that I showed you in the previous slide, was partly due to heavy fishing. <laughs> Diagrammatically, this was shown, and I think this is probably oversimplified now, 
as having two regimes. They called them the anchovy and the sardine regime. What they were really talking about was what the ocean looked like in one mode versus another, and what the upwelling and the primary productivity looked like in the other. But there's a rapid shift um, and there's a gradual shift in these regimes. Using this to explain how the anchovy sardines might have alternated with each other. So, okay. The point of this is fluctuations occur. Back up for no reason. Interannual variability in both short lived anchovies is high. I call short lived between eight and 15 years. And I think I don't think any of them get that long old anymore. They possess relatively low fecundity, not too many offspring and moderate ages at maturity. There are large scale temperature and regime changes in oceanographic, oceanic temperature regimes, supporting the dominance of anchovies or sardines during altering periods. It also has fluctuated in rockfish populations and other things that have been more studied recently too. Interestingly, these are synchronous variations in lots of places off Japan, California, Peru, and Chile, all parts of the, a similar but larger system. Environmental variability can influence fishery sustainability and the distribution and abundance of targeted species. This diagram is kind of cool because it's, it comes from highly um, sophisticated, sophistic, um, sophisticated statistical analysis, but it shows what they purport to show as a cycle. And if you look at the cycle and you find the organisms that are in it, the sardines are right here. This is in the 30s and 40s. Other organisms are there. And then in the 50s and 60s, there are the anchovies over here. And so there's this cycle. This reminds me a lot of, the, and I can't read it. I put it down on the slide, I think, but the Ray Trope um, murals that he painted on the old Noah building in Pacific Grove that reflect this California current and the changes and cycles of um, organisms. This is much more complex than I have time to get into or, or that I even understand, <clears throat> but it puts the sardine anchovy fluctuations into an oceanographic regime dealing with temperatures and upwelling. Now I'm gonna switch and I'm gonna to go to an invertebrate that is really just a fish that swims backwards. It's the market squid. And they used to call it laligo, now it's gory teethy. Toothless, but I th think some people like Lou Zeidberg um, argue about that. It goes through fluctuations too. We're going to focus on Monterey Bay, which actually has an April recruitment and a November recruitment, but there's also a later recruitment down in the Southern California Bight down here. Now, these animals are short lived, maybe a year. We used to think 18 months, and they spawn and then they die. And so the fishery for them takes them hopefully right after they've, they've spawned and then they die and they die from the fish food. And what you can see are monthly fluctuations. These are months across here. These are landings. This is another unique thing we have to use the catch and the effort and the catch per unit effort, these three uh, axes to look at the fluctuations over the months of Lalago opalescence, in this case off Monterey. You see in April, the dark bars, the dark spots, and you see in October, the uh, lighter bars. So we have two different spawning periods in Southern California. It's primarily in the winter, but I understand that's changed a little bit. Nonetheless, there are also interannual fluctuations, and they apparently are due probably to regime shifts, as I just described, but also to El Nino and La Nina events. This is from the same paper by Zeidberg, Hamner, et al. Uh, on Lalago or Dorituthis. And what it shows is years from 1981 up to almost present, showing what happens to squid spawning when there's a strong El Nino. The catch per unit effort goes down. The effort goes down because there's not many of them there. And therefore, there's no landings. And then another strong El Nino, they go down again. And then if there's a strong La Nina, which is the relaxation of the El Nino, the squid, squid tend to spawn. So this can be explained in a separate slide, which is probably a little too complex, but basically it shows that in October and April, you have 
different um, correlation coefficients to SOI, which is the Southern Ocean, Southern Ocean Oscillation Index. I don't think the word ocean's in there. And the El Nino effect. So those are the two parameters we just talked about. The take home message is the catch per unit effort of squid declines. Um, I don't get that right. Of effort is higher when the sea surface temp temperature is colder and declines when it's the other, the other way around. That's right. Declines when it's warm. Okay. So what I've covered is fluctuations do occur in populations of marine organisms, ranging from primate producers like kelp, predators and grazers like sea stars and sea urchins, carnivores like sea otters, fishes, and squid. In some cases, these are due partially or entirely to environmental changes like El Nino, the ocean index, et cetera, and, and sea surface temperatures. Um, they also likely cause these population changes. So human influences like fishing and perhaps carbon-driven climate change can figure in this total story. My take-home point is that Ed Ricketts did amazing work in the few decades he did his work in the intertidal off the Pacific Grove and other parts of the, of the West Coast. Um, he knew these things, but he couldn't have known them in as much detail as is presently possible for the scads and scads of environmental scientists and fishery biologists and oceanographers that are going out and doing these surveys now. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. That was a great presentation. Um, at this time, uh, we'll open up the floor if anyone has any questions. Um, hey. Please feel free to unmute yourself and um, chime in. I guess I don't have to do that. I'm already unmuted. <laughs> so is there hope for our sea stars? Yes, I think so, Lila. From what I've heard from several people, including Pete Ramundi, that the environmental conditions are going to be less beneficial to the viruses that we're going to get. They're going to get a hold of those. And in some cases, I heard, and I haven't seen this in writing, that the sea star up north in Northern California has recovered in patches. Maybe somebody in the audience knows more than, than that. Uh, hi, um, my name's Melanie. Uh, I, I'm a reef check diver. And oh, every time I dive uh, in the breakwater area, in Monterey, I see evidence of wasting, sea star wasting. Not at all like it was before, but you know, maybe one percent of the sea the bat stars, and occasionally one of the other stars will have the wasting lesions, or be have arms that are just dropping off. Yeah, I've heard so, about that. The virus is still there. I've heard about that, but not recently. It's, I'm sad to hear it. Yeah, and, last um, week. <laughs> and and somebody, Melanie, uh, Melanie, where were you diving? Um, Coast Guard Pier in um, Monterey. Okay, thank you. So fairly shallow depths. It's called San know. Carlos Beach. Yeah, sorry. Thank you for the observation. I'm sad to hear it. Yeah, me too. But as Greg, I said, cycles occur and maybe we'll cycle out of it. Greg, do you know if our divers that are out there with the hammers are making a difference in the urchin population or is it just a drop in the bucket, so to say? I don't, I don't know. I've heard I can address of... that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. My I'm point one of, is I I'm one of those. Been, been are you? Oh, yeah. well, super. Thank you. So, so the, the Fish and Game Commission will not allow us in the marine protected areas to protect those areas that Joshua really? Smith um, said that, you know, we're trying to keep those oases going. Uh, the area that we're working on is, is outside of that um, in Monterey. And we were able to, in just a few months, call the urchins from uh, oh, a little over seven per square meter down to less than one per square meter through well, hundreds of hours of diving and 65 trained urchin divers. Wow. So some of the kelp is coming back. The question is, is will we be able to maintain it? 
because it's surrounded by urchin barren, uh, and those urchins mm. don't sit there hungry. They move into the cold area. Right. So it's a three-year project. So I guess Mark cool. call, Carl would call those re reverse oases, huh? Something like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's nice news. Do you have any idea of if Reef Check and the other folks are planning to publish that? The, well, they just went out. Reef Check and NOAA, the mm. divers, just went out and did their own surveys. The Reef Check uh, survey information is available. Well, it's not available now, but it's done. Um, that's how we got the number of of you know one per square meter. And uh, we don't know when the Fish and Game Commission or the Fish and Wildlife Department's data will be published. Thank, Thank you, you, Melanie. Thank you for doing that. It would be nice if we had that information. Maybe we'd get a speaker from ReefCheck or you to talk to a future audience about this result, because that's really fascinating. Yeah, Richard Parrish here. Hi, Can Richard. Okay. Yes. One of the things that uh, influences all these time series is that the length of the time series often gives you a wrong indication of what's happening. So if you start during a low, it looks like things are getting better and vice versa. And I just want to add that uh, there are longest time series you showed that were for sardine, uh, but actually the, the sardine time series goes beyond that if you look into the publications. The early publications in the 1930s uh, they didn't know that sardine went back and forth between Canada and Southern California. And some of the early papers pointed out uh, that before 1920, sardines were unknown in Canada. So sardine didn't have two low periods. It actually had three low periods mm. that we have historical records on. And then when the, the population bloomed, that you showed building up on the fishery came, Canada had very large landings, which then of course at the collapse, the next time we went into cold water occurred. So the difficulty of sorting things out is we're dealing with a cycle of something like 60 years. Then we have an El Nino cycle. Then we have a seasonal cycle. And then we have predators. So it's really difficult to pull these things out. Thank you for that. It was a very nice um, summary. I, I didn't want to try to get into it in that depth. And I knew if there was, if you were in the audience, you'd be able to do that. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> All right. Is there any more questions for Greg before we, we wrap this up? Sure, I've got one. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So, so we've got these real extensive urchin barrens, and then we have these these areas that are still um, have too many urchins, but the kelp is doing is fairly successful. Do you see any way that other than human intervention or disease that will get those urchin barrens to go back to kelp forests? because the sea stars won't eat them and the otters won't eat them because the gonad index is so low. Right, and I stated that. Um, I don't really know. Uh, Mark Carr seemed to think that storms would help because it might even cause mortality in urchins. But I don't know if that's true. Urchin barons have gone away in previous cases, like off um, Point Loma, by just, it, decreasing the turbidity in the water by cleaning up the sewage. So maybe there's something environmental that will occur. I don't really know. It's not something yeah, to study personally. I, I read that there were some urchin barrens in the 50s that were probably related to uh, refuse in the water from the canneries, but um, Monterey Bay is fairly clean now. Yes, and I've never heard of that from here. I heard of it from off, off Point Loma down by San Diego only. And that was in the 70s, yeah. late 60s, early 70s. One thing I didn't mention that I could talk a little bit about is an older paper by Paul Dayton and two of his colleagues, Rosenthal and Clark. They tagged individual kelp plants off Del Mar. 
and monitored them for over a decade. I think it might have been 20, 15 or 20 years. And they documented the longevity of kelp down there to be about seven or eight years maximum and about three to four years on average. And that most of the mortality occurred when the canopy got so large and the holdfast got so large but wasn't strong enough to hold the kelp down that they washed away in storms. Um, at that time, of course, there were recruits available to settle out. And when he had bare areas, the kelp came in really fast. But urchins weren't a part of that picture yet. Greg, we have a question that came in. Uh, can you suggest any sources on the salmon fishery collapse around the 1900s in Monterey Bay in San Francisco? No. That's my simple answer. I, I was an ichthyologist for years, and I, I, I swore that I would never study salmon. <laughs> and you can ask all my graduate students for two reasons. There's so many species, and there's so many studies already going on. And there's three reasons, and there's so many other species to look at. So I don't know the answer to that. Richard might know some fishery guys that could answer the question, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. So I, I would suggest, I would propose that a lot of it has to do with habitat modification and spawning streams. That's my guess. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Greg. That was fascinating. And thank you, Melanie, for introducing me to the term gonad index. Never heard that before. I'll be thinking about that all night. Monica Fish people do that too. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Greg. And hugs to your better half, Di. She's watching, so she's oh, hearing it. All yeah. right. Well, hi, Di. <laughs> well, Thank you everyone for attending. And Greg, thank you very much for that great presentation. Um, we were gonna wrap it up right now, um, but can we road a hoop de doodle programs continue? Um, next week, we will have a presenter um, on the Canary, uh, the Sweet Thursday um, Broadway, which came out in 19, I'm drawing a blank on the date, but um, Pipe Dream by Roger Steen and Hammerstein. So we'll be looking at uh, Sweet Thursday, but on Broadway. So if you'd like to register for that program next week, um, please visit the Monterey Public Library. And uh, again, thank you to our sponsors, our community sponsors, the Cannery Row Foundation, Cannery Row Company, Western Flyer, and the Monterey Public Library. Thank you all for joining and thank you again, Greg. Have a, hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.